Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Patrick Whaley. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Strategic Policy and Industry Relations. I'm pleased to be joined by Gus Sarakis, our first Deputy Commissioner, and Alex Fisher, our Deputy Commissioner for Legal and Regulatory Affairs. Uh, during this session, we'll be briefing you on a package of legislation the Department has proposed that will deepen the progress we've made on improving safety on our construction sites. So the precursor to what we're trying to accomplish here is Local Law 196 of 2017. And this law requires safety training for workers on sites that require a site safety manager, a site safety coordinator, or a construction superintendent. Specifically, workers on sites are required to have 40 hours of site safety training and supervisors defined as site safety managers, site safety coordinators, construction superintendents, and concrete safety managers are required to have 62 hours of site safety training. This law has been implemented in phases over the past three and a half years um, with full implementation occurring this past March 1st. You'll see on this slide, it shows the tremendous progress we've made in getting our construction workers throughout the city trained. Through April of this year, more than 132,000 site safety training cards have been issued. What's particularly encouraging is the 35,000 plus supervisor site safety training cards that have been issued to those who've received 62 hours of site safety training. Given that there are only approximately 5,000 of these licensees who require this training, the fact that there are over 35,000 workers who have received this card is certainly very encouraging and it's well in excess of what the law actually requires. And this slide here shows us that um, throughout the city, there are nearly 4,700 construction sites that require local law 196 trained workers. So you'll see clearly there's not a neighborhood throughout our city where we don't have construction sites that require this training and have many thousands of workers who right now have this important safety training. And if you re reconcile this slide with the one I previously showed, 132,000 plus site safety training cards issued for close to 4,700 construction sites certainly demonstrates that there's excellent saturation of local law 196 trained workers throughout our city. So as you've heard earlier this morning, we have seen a significant decrease in injuries and fatalities the past couple of years. And this is certainly a credit to the rollout of local law 196 and site safety trained workers and our performing proactive safety inspections on our high risk sites. Of course, um, our partners in industry deserve credit for continuing to prioritize safety and giving it the uh, prioritization and, and, and treatment that it certainly deserves. Since 2018, we've seen a 34% reduction in injuries across our construction sites and also a 33% decrease in fatalities. And while we're certainly pleased with this progress, there's more work to be done to improve safety on our sites. And so we're excited to share with you a package of proposals that will do just that. Uh, there are five proposals. The first one is to license all general contractors. And with that, I'll turn it over to our deputy commissioner, Alex Fisher, to continue the presentation. Thank you, Patrick. So the first part of um, our set of bills is this proposal to license all general contractors in the city of New York. The department lacks the tools to appropriately discipline the few bad actor general contractors whose negligence results in the serious injury or death of their employees, as well as serious property damage. Currently, general contractors who seek permits from the department to perform most major construction in the city are not required to be licensed by the department to perform such construction. General contractors must only register with the department or obtain a safety registration number from the department, depending on the type of work they're seeking to perform. Because general contractors are not licensed by the department, there is no requirement that they demonstrate any practical experience, that they obtain any training, or that they undergo, undergo any background checks. This proposal would allow for greater oversight by the department over general contractors who engage in construction or demolition work. By licensing them in a similar manner, other trades under the department's jurisdiction are licensed. 
Our proposal would require general contractors to demonstrate their experience, including practical experience working in the construction industry, require general contractors to have a site safety training supervisor card, hold general contractors responsible for the work they perform under their permits, which could include requiring that they submit plans to the department for addressing hazardous violations for a site under their control, or requiring that they employ a safety compliance officer. Finally, this would improve the department's ability to discipline general contractors, which could include suspending or revoking their license in the most egregious of circumstances. Some examples of the limitations that we face today on discipline include the following incidents, which involve fatalities or serious property damage resulting from extreme negligence. Safety registrant holder Jose Martinez was the contractor and construction super on a work site at 12015 84th Avenue, where two separate construction accidents occurred. Due to improper safety measures, an adjoining property was heavily damaged during excavation in July 2017, and a roof collapsed during demolition in August 2017 as well. We also have safety registrant Jorge Espejo. This is a contractor permit holder for a new building at 714 39th Street in Brooklyn. On September 13th of 2018, a retaining wall collapsed at the site, killing one worker, Luis Almonte. A subsequent audit of Mr. Espeo's other projects revealed that several of the sites were undergoing work without a required construction super. Finally, safety registration holder Isaac Deutsch, contractor and permit holder involved in a construction accident at 859-833 Myrtle Avenue on November 21st, 2018. One worker, Over Paredes, was killed after a prefabricated panel fell off the third story of a 10-story residential building under construction. I'll speak more later today about this proposal in detail. Turning it back over. Thanks, Alex. Our next proposal, um, we seek to expand what we refer to as the major building universe. So we use the term major building to define large scopes of work that are 10 stories and above. And by large scopes of work, we include new building construction, significant alterations such as enlargement and demolitions. And given the greater safety risks that are associated with major buildings, we require more bells and whistles on these projects, namely the requirement to have a DOB licensed safety professional on these construction sites, which is a site safety coordinator for those sites between 10 and 14 stories, and a site safety manager at 15 stories and above. And we also require the preparation of a site safety plan to be submitted to the, the department for our review and approval before work on these projects can commence. We spent a great deal of time reviewing a host of data that we have in our possession, and it tells us on a permit basis, basis injury and fatalities are 10 times more likely to occur on major scopes of work in the seven to nine story range than for the same scopes of work um, less than seven stories. So therefore, we're seeking to drop the threshold for a major building to large scopes of work seven stories and above. This would require these projects in the seven to nine story range to designate either a site safety coordinator or a site safety manager, and would also require these projects to submit a site safety plan to the department for its review and approval. Currently for these projects, they are required to have a site safety plan, but they're required to be maintained on site and not submitted to the department um, for its review and approval. So under this proposal, um, we'll be adding give or take about a couple hundred sites every year to the universe that require a DOB licensed safety professional and the submission of site safety plans of the department for its review and approval. The next proposal speaks to requiring more safety supervision, again, on our larger construction sites. So as we just discussed, Currently, major scopes of work, 10 stories and above, require a site safety manager or a site safety coordinator. For major scopes of work, nine stories and below, a construction superintendent is required. Again, new buildings, significant alterations, demolitions, excluding, of course, new construction of one, two, and three family homes. What we are proposing is to require a construction superintendent on major buildings as well. So 10 stories and above, and the construction superintendent would serve alongside the site safety coordinator or site safety manager. Site safety coordinators and site safety managers serve as dedicated safety monitor 
whereas a construction superintendent is responsible for overall project management, which of course includes a safety component. So this slide here provides a little bit more detail in terms of um, the requirements for a site safety manager and a site safety coordinator relative to a construction superintendent. And you'll see that site safety coordinators and site safety managers are responsible that all work is being conducted in accordance with sound construction practices and that they're uh, performed in accordance with the approved construction documents. They're also responsible for monitoring compliance with site safety plans and tenant protection plans. The construction superintendent, again, their role is more broad and it's about overall project management, although it does certainly have an important safety component. Um, and, this, and the construction superintendent is responsible for taking appropriate actions to ensure unsafe work or conditions are addressed, um, that all appropriate inspections are being performed, and they're also responsible for leading weekly safety meetings. One other provision of this legislation addresses the number of sites that a construction superintendent could be responsible for at any one point in time. Currently, a construction superintendent could be responsible for as many as 10 sites at any one more point in time. When they're not on a particular site, a competent person has to serve in place of the uh, construction superintendent. In this legislation, we're seeking to reduce the number of sites that a construction superintendent would be responsible for. By 2026, a construction superintendent would be, no, would be responsible for no more than one site at any one point in time. And so under these three proposals that we've just discussed, um, if enacted, large scopes of work, seven stories or greater will have a licensed general contractor, along with all scopes of work utilizing a general contractor. These larger sites will have a licensed site safety manager, site safety coordinator, and a licensed construction superintendent. And this will further improve safety across all the city's construction sites. With that, I'll turn it over to First Deputy Commissioner Gus Sarakis to discuss the next proposal concerning cold form steel. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. And today, we're going to be discussing further some of the advancements that we are proposing for safety when using cold form steel during construction. Uh, overloading uh, during installation has been a problem in the past here in the city of New York, and it comes from potentially some unique practices here in New York, utilizing both masonry and cold form steel on the same site and loading the floors of the cold form steel or and the load bearing walls of cold, cold form steel before the members are actually properly installed according to the plans and according to codes and standards to the point where they can actually take the weight of the intended loading here. And this has caused some uh, collapses and fatalities in the past. Uh, to that end, the department in 2019 issued a buildings bulletin further enhancing the requirements for the erection of cold form steel construction uh, and identifying clearly the responsibilities of the special inspectors required on these job sites, the construction superintendents on these job sites, the permit holders, as well as the design professionals and general contractors here to make clear what each of their duties were with regards to the sequence of construction and clearly identifying what areas could be temporarily loaded, what could not, and when was temporary framing sufficiently in place to allow for such loading. The department continued by doing outreach to the construction industry to warn them of the dangers associated with this overloading and with installing this material out of sequence and loading it out of sequence and highlighting some best practices that can be done. But to further the, the safety of both the workers and the public when using this type of material, the department is proposing legislation here to implement the requirements that were in this building's bulletin and to go a step further, namely, we're going to require that the drawings kept on site clearly identify all the temporary bracing, but also go a step further and clearly identify the areas that are acceptable for temporary loading. Uh, and if there is no temporary loading permitted on the floors to clearly indicate that as well and to require checks be performed by those relevant parties on the job site and that those temporary loading areas be clearly identified in the field, namely by like spray painting on the decking area to show where the loading can be placed and how much loading can be put on here. 
uh, the following the proper sequence here is something that uh, can save lives and make projects move forward in a safe manner for everyone involved. And one of the last pieces of legislation you're going to hear about today is a proposal that the department has to ban the use of a product called a standoff bracket. Uh, a standoff bracket is an attachment put on uh, the installation of a suspended scaffold, a traditionally called a C-hook scaffold, to provide additional clearance from the face of the building. The problem is that the product itself changes the dynamics and the loading patterns of how the C-hook and suspended scaffold overall work and can be a uh, cause of overloading both the parapet and uh, overturning and uh, twisting of the bracket itself, causing uh, incidents, including uh, a, a few that have happened here in the city where the use of the standoff bracket was found to be a contributing factor. Uh, in response to that, the department issued a buildings bulletin prohibiting the use of these standoff brackets until such time as we had the ability to further study their utilization. Uh, we reached out to those in the construction industry as to how they utilize these things, what uh, calculations and what analysis they had done when utilizing these things in their installation. And ultimately we determined that uh, the best course of action is to memorialize this prohibition in the code uh, for all intents and purposes and uh, going forward. Uh, we have not seen use of this bracket in some time uh, as people have been complying with the requirements of our building's bulletin, and uh, this would not actually prohibit the use of sea hooks and suspended scaffolds going forward, uh, just the use of this product uh, with the sea hooks. Lastly, just a mention of the fact that on April 22, the department's uh, code revision efforts uh, came to the point where the city council was introducing our legislation uh, with the proposed code changes to bring our codes in line with the 2015 International Code Council I codes, and that you can find more information about this on our website. And also, uh, if you have any questions, this is really the conclusion of our current presentation, but here's an email address where you can send technical questions on any of the legislation that you've heard about today. Uh, as well as if you have uh, further interest in the code revision bill, uh, you could see the, the summary and the progress on our website. With that, I'll turn it back to Patrick and uh, we will start to go through questions in the uh, Q&A field. If you do have a question, please uh, type it into the chat and we will do our best to answer it for you. Thank you, Gus. So um, it looks like we have a few questions related to uh, the construction super legislation in particular. And so just to provide a few points of clarification on, on that, yes, I believe it is correct that the prior law was Local Law 81. Uh, what we're doing here is making amendments to Local Law 81 in a couple, certainly in a couple of very important respects, whereas Local Law 81 um, specifically excluded a construction superintendent from serving on a major building, from serving alongside a site safety manager or a site safety coordinator. The legislation that we're advancing repeals that language. And so again, construction superintendents would be required to serve alongside a site safety coordinator or a site safety manager as the case might be. Let's see, a question here is our understanding that our solar jobs, which not currently require a construction superintendent, an SSM or an SSC, will have no additional requirements on the local law 196. However, any solar jobs which would require construction super site safety coordinators like new particular manager need to comply with the SST requirements. Can you confirm how this will impact solar jobs? As it relates to local law 196 um, and site safety training requirements, the only instance where a specific scope of work or any scope of work is, is, is included is to the extent to which that law, that job requires a safety professional. So if that job currently requires a construction super, a site safety coordinator, or a site safety manager, that job is therefore captured in the local 196, and therefore workers serving on that job are required to have site safety training. Uh, the timeline uh, for approval of this legislation, um, as Gus had mentioned, in addition to the larger code revision update being introduced recently, um, these five um, legislative proposals 
were also introduced at the city council just a couple weeks ago. Um, it is our hope that it will receive a hearing next month. And of course, we'll uh, work hard to keep you all posted with how things progress. Another question we received uh, relates to cost impacts. Have we given any thought to the cost associated with having um, additional safety personnel on a construction site? So we certainly have, certainly as it relates to the requirement on major buildings, dropping the threshold to seven to nine stories, require either a site safety coordinator or a site safety manager on these sites. We certainly have given it some thought. We've discussed with a lot of people and based on typical project types that we've uh, had discussions with folks on, we anticipate that for say for an affordable housing job that is in the seven to nine story range, we estimate an increase of project costs about a percent, maybe 2% of increase in costs. And from the department's perspective, given the need for better safety outcomes on these jobs, it certainly is a worthwhile investment. Okay, we're just scrolling through a couple of these questions here. Um, one we received asks uh, if a construction super will be required on a facade job uh, that currently has a site safety manager and a qualified person for site safety. Yes, under the proposed legislation, there would need to be a construction super to serve, to serve alongside the site safety manager on that job. 10 story building, do you need a construction site safety and a construction supervisor? Um, 10 story building depends on the scope of work on that 10 story building. If we're talking about, you know, an NB significant uh, uh, alteration, such as an enlargement or demolition, yes, in addition to the site safety personnel, you'll need to have a construction superintendent as well. Yes, so there's a question here about GT licensing, whether existing GTs would be OBR or grandfathered. I'll speak a little bit more about this later today, but short answer, yes. If you're a GC123 registrant with the department, there's a sort of a full grandfathering, and then it, it changes a little bit for safety registrants and completely for insurance tracking holders, but a little more later on that. Another question we received asks if all competent persons assigned by the construction superintendent need to have the 62 hours supervisor SST card. The answer is that yes. Um, the, the construction super is required to have a supervisor site safety training card. A competent person filling in their stead is also required to have a supervisor site safety training card. But again, bear in mind under our proposed legislation, over time we're phasing in a construction superintendent being responsible for fewer sites. But by 2026, they could only have one site at a time. So this reduces opportunities for competent persons to serve in a construction superintendent's place and therefore reduces opportunities for a competent person to need 62 hours site safety training. If approved, when are these uh, legislation go into effect? So um, the general contracting licensing proposal, um, it's three years. Um, major buildings proposal, um, it is also three years. The construction superintendent is next year, although again, 
we're phasing in the requirement over time that there be one uh, construction superintendent per site. So that would kick in in 2026. Um, and then cold form steel and standoff brackets, uh, that is immediate, is that correct, Gus? Yeah. And those take effect immediately. Will the site super have to sign the PW2 is the question, and the answer is yes. Eventually, we will be requiring the licensees assigned to a particular job site to be signing this, the uh, permit application itself, whether it's in DOB now or the paper application process. Are non-licensed individuals conducting inspections on site on behalf of licensed individuals or firms? Examples provide are special inspections, soil, soil concrete, SOE, required to have SST training. So the law provides that only those workers who engage in construction and demolition work are required to have the training under Local Law 196. In addition, licensees, with the exception of the safety professionals who require site safety training, our licensees are not required to have safety training on the local law 196. So only the, to the extent that these folks are engaging an SST site are actually engaging in construction demolition work, only in that instance are they required to have the training under local law 196. So the question has come up about uh, how would the construction superintendent and the site safety manager and coordinator uh, duties be impacted? And the, the question is uh, a good one in that they will be impacted. They will need to be amended. And the site safety manager and site safety coordinator on the sites that require them as well as a superintendent would continue to perform their, their safety inspections that they are required to do and the construction super's role and responsibility would be changed to work with those folks to make sure that those inspections and uh, checklist items have been taken care of and the two would need to work hand in hand to make sure along with the general contractor that the safety requirements of the code are being adhered to by all those on the site as well as that the work is progressing according to the approved plans and documents uh, all three of these folks on the job site and their involvement on the job site uh, will be necessary to make sure that everything is moving forward in a safe manner. Uh, the question about the suspended scaffold, does the department expect to ban the use of sea hooks altogether? Know that uh, specifically is not the case here. We are not proposing to ban the use of sea hooks. The intention of the legislation is to prohibit the use of this uh, product with the sea hooks, namely the standoff bracket. There is no other impact to the use of sea hook suspended scaffolds being proposed. Okay, uh, that covers all the questions that have been asked for us. Uh, on behalf of first Deputy Commissioner Sorakis, Deputy Commissioner Alex Fisher, uh, thank you all very much for your time and participation uh, and be well, take care.